Now my heart is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, This voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. But I, when I am lifted from the earth, will draw all men to myself. He said this to show what kind of death he was going to die. The crowd spoke up. We have heard from the law that the, that the Christ will remain forever. So how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Then Jesus told them, You are going to have the light just a little while longer. Walk while you have the light before darkness overtakes you. The man who walks in the dark does not know where he is going. Put your trust in the light while you have it, so that you may become sons of light. When he had finished speaking, Jesus left and hid himself from them. Thanks, Maya, very much indeed for reading and reading so well. Let me read again the first verse from that passage. John chapter 12 and verse 27. Jesus said, Now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Let's pray. Loving Father, we would like to see Jesus. So help us to understand his teaching, that we might see him, know him, love him, serve him. And we pray for your name's sake. Amen. Well, I'm looking around, I'm imagining those who are watching at home, and I'm pretty sure that none of you are going to feature on Piers Morgan's life stories, I'm guessing. And I don't know, but I shouldn't think many of you will have biographies written about you. I doubt you'll be writing your autobiography. But let's just imagine someone is focusing in on your life. What would be the key moments that they'd choose? Or if you were writing your own life story, what would be the key moments? If you just had to choose one key moment, it'd be quite hard, wouldn't it? What would it be? Winston Churchill wrote an account of his early life, and it's hard to think of any other life with so much packed into it. And he concluded that account with these words, that I married and lived happily ever afterwards. Isn't that lovely? And he saw his marriage as an absolute key turning point in his life. He wrote those words actually 10 years before he became prime minister. And yes, his marriage was very significantly, but, but surely everyone would recognize Churchill's finest hour for those early days in May 1940 when he came to be prime minister and Britain very much stood alone against the Nazi regime and Churchill was so key and that that hour, that period of his life was vital not just for him, but for the whole world. Well, here Jesus is talking about his hour, his absolutely decisive moment. Do you remember the context? He's just ridden into Jerusalem on a donkey, fulfilling the prophecy of Zechariah that when the Messiah came, God's king, he had entered Jerusalem on a donkey, and the crowds hailed him as king. And then we saw last week that some Greeks, some Gentiles came and they said to one of the disciples, Sir, we'd like to see Jesus. And rather surprisingly, Jesus doesn't say, oh, just show them in. He says in effect, oh, they will see me. They'll see me soon enough because my hour is about to come. And he uses that same language of the hour. Verse 27, we just read it. Now my soul is troubled. By the way, I find that a real encouragement, that it's possible to have a very troubled soul without sin. 
Don't feel guilty because your soul is troubled. And Jesus in his perfection is troubled at the horrific prospect of what lay before him. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came into the world. What a lovely song we heard earlier. Why did Jesus come into the world? He's saying, this is why I came. This is the hour. This is the key moment. The key moment, not just for him personally, but the turning point of history. A key moment for the cosmos. Father, he says, verse 28, glorify your name. There's the passion of his life. And a voice came from heaven only three times where a voice comes from heaven and the Father intervenes as a way of saying, look, this is very, very significant. The voice at the baptism and the transfiguration, this is my beloved Son. And now just before he heads to the cross, a voice from heaven telling those who listened, even if they didn't understand at the time, this is hugely significant. And the voice said, I have glorified it and will glorify it again. Outwardly, someone hanging on a cross is as shameful as it gets. Agonizing, deeply degrading. And that's about to be Jesus' fate. There was nothing sanitized about it. It was bloody, horrific, agonizing, and yet that is his hour, the moment he came into the world for. It's a moment not of shame, but of astonishing glory. I don't know what you make of that. If you're not a Christian, you might be confused, and it may be listening to these words of Jesus, as in verses 31 and 32, he explains why this shameful event is a glorious event. It could be the turning point of your life. And grasping these things was certainly the turning point of my life. For the rest of you, like me, there's frankly no shock in this anymore. You know it so well. You've heard loads of talks on the cross. I've given loads of talks on the cross. And you might be thinking, oh, I hope my friend is not really clear on these things, is listening. But actually, if it's true that that is the turning point, it continues to be the moment around which, as it were, the whole world revolves. It should be the, the moment around which our lives revolve. This revolution is not a one-off when we get converted. It should be ongoing. Every day should be lived in the light of that hour. And for me, I think this week there's been a reconversion. There should be a reconversion every day, if you like. And I've been struck afresh as I've looked at verses 31 and 32 of things I've known for years and reminded these are the events, these are the things that my life must revolve around. 31 and 32, let me read them. Jesus explaining why this is glorious, this is the hour. Now, the hour, now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I'm lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. What's going on at the cross? It's judgment on the world. It's victory over Satan. It's salvation for anyone. These are revolutionary truths every day. First, it's judgment on the world, verse 31. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Well, that's rather strange, because if you walk past that scene, you'd assume what's happening is the judgment of the world on Jesus. He's been on trial before the religious authorities, and they've accused him of being a terrible, wicked blasphemer. He's then taken to Pilate, and Pilate knows he's innocent, but goes along with it. He doesn't want to cause trouble. He wants to mollify the crowds. And so Jesus 
is pinned to a cross. There's the judgment of the world on Jesus. But Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. Yeah, there's that going on, but that's not the key thing that's going on. Don't you notice, this is not so much the judgment of the world, but the judgment on the world. I remember years ago, watching a television program where there was a, an invited audience discussing the rising amount of theft in society at the time, and people got quite agitated. And they were outraged about what was going on. They said, lock him up, throw away the key, higher sentences. What they didn't know, as, a, as that audience arrived, there were hidden cameras around the building, and the producers had put, in various places, 20-pound notes just hanging around. And they revealed afterwards what happened. Time and time again, people would see a 20-pound note, of course it didn't belong to them, and put it in their pocket and walk on. And in the program, as it were, they were pointing fingers at those terrible thieves and then suddenly <laughs> that test had revealed their own hearts and a finger was pointing at them. The world accuses Jesus, finds him wanting. But you might say there's never been a more profound test of human nature than when perfect goodness the divine Son of God came into the world. And what happened? He was despised and rejected and crucified. It's like judgment of the world. It's actually the judgment on the world. This is what we're like. We might think, hang on, hang on, hang on. Don't bring me into this. I wasn't there. We're talking centuries ago. but actually in our hearts by nature is exactly the same kind of instinct that led those people to kill him. Jesus told a parable, the parable of the tenants. There was a man who owned a vineyard and he rented it out to some tenants and once a year he sent a servant to receive the rent. The servant arrives, the tenants don't want to give the money so they beat up the servant. Then another is sent, he's killed. Then another, he's beaten up. Then another, he's killed. And then finally he says, I've got no one else to send, just my beloved son. Surely, they respect my son. But they killed him too. And Jesus says, what do you, what do you think that man is going to do to those tenants? Well, it's very obvious. Surely he must judge them. We don't like the thought that our lives are entrusted to us, that we are tenants. We're accountable as to how we use them. We like to think that we are the owners. It's up to me to do what I like. And anyone who comes in and tries to cramp our style, yes, even the God who's given us our lives, is resented in different ways. Some very overtly don't believe in God, others of us more subtly. But the natural human instinct is to want to live our lives as if we own them, without any accountability, without any higher authority. And it's that attitude which the Bible says is the heart of sin. It's that attitude that led to Jesus being killed. The cross is judgment on the world. But wonderfully, that's not all. Next, it's victory over Satan. Again, verse 31, now the prince of this world will be driven out. The prince of this world, that's Satan. During our daily services in Lent, the last couple of weeks, we've been thinking about uh, temptation. We've been thinking about the devil tempting Jesus. And in one of those daily services. I said how I became a Christian. I started going along to a little Christian meeting. I heard the Bible taught, and I lapped it up. I believed it all. Until one talk, when a man was explaining what the Bible said about the devil, and I thought, hang on. <laughs> you don't really expect me to believe that. It's the first time I found it hard to believe something I was hearing. 
It seemed to me so old-fashioned, medieval, out of date. We're sophisticated people now. Surely you don't expect me to believe in a devil. In the 20th century, human beings thought that they'd come of age. We left behind those kind of unsophisticated, supernatural ways of talking about the world, Satan, nonsense. But then look what happened in the 20th century. And the ways in which human beings have started talking about the world in, in, in sort of rational, unsupernatural ways just didn't look adequate in the face of Hitler's final solution, Stalin's purge, Mao's cultural revolution, Pol Pot's killing fields. Those kind of events demand not just rational human beings doing things, but they demand the language of the bestial, the demonic, the satanic. It's not only when we look at the world though, is it? that we have to say there's something more going on. Because I doubt I'm the only one who at times looks at my life and thinks, this is just madness. And the kind of things i can capable of saying, thinking, doing, I know they're wrong, I don't want to do them. I know they're destructive to myself and to other people. And yet at times we feel powerless, as if there's... Something, yes, supernatural. Someone, surely. That's what the Bible is saying. The more we look at the world with honest eyes, the more we look at our own lives with honest eyes, the more the Bible's account makes sense. And what the Bible says is, the moment we succumb to that instinct, which is in all human beings, to turn away from God, as it were, to kill him, to push him out of our lives and to act as if we own our lives, that moment... We, as it were, hand ourselves over into the grip of Satan. Because once we sin, the holy, just God must separate himself from us. Sin demands judgment. And as a result, we're in the grip of the evil one, facing the penalty of death, exactly where he wants us. And yet, wonderfully, even though the cross manifests, reveals, God's judgment and hatred of human sin and the wickedness of human sin, it's also the amazing moment of mercy and rescue as Jesus comes into the world to take on Satan. And again, there's irony here. That moment of horrific shame, amazing glory. That moment that looked like shameful defeat, triumphant victory. Sin separated us from God, but Jesus took the penalty. And if I trust in him, because Jesus took the penalty, Satan's got no hold on me. And even though I've done many bad things because Jesus died for me, I'm righteous in God's sight, and I'm no longer under the grit of Satan. Again, in one of those daily services, I talk about that sort of horror film trope, where in the face of demons, people do the sign of the cross and the demons run. Of course, it's, it's in a sense, a nonsense. There's, there's no power in a, a sign of a cross, but there is absolute power in the reality of the cross. And there's nothing that makes the devil shake more than the fact that Jesus died. Because he died, died for us, we can be transferred from the domain of the devil into the kingdom of light, and there's nothing the devil can do about it. I love the picture language of the book of Revelation. And in Revelation 12, there's a cartoon quality to the description of Satan being hurled out of heaven. And you can imagine, in the moment Jesus dies, as if someone grabs Satan by the scruff of his neck and kicks him out. And what that's saying is, he's no longer got a voice in heaven. So in the moment I sin, he's still not given up. He's still squirming around, not acknowledging defeat, that final 
moment will come when Jesus returns. He's still trying to accuse, and I know he's accusing voice. But that picture's saying, God doesn't hear it. He's got no voice in heaven. And we're people who live in the light of victory. Remember what I said? You know these things. But every day is a revolution day. Every day should be a conversion day. Every day should be a day that revolves around this event. So let me ask yourself, as I've been asking myself this week, are you living in victory? You think of yourself as belonging to the winning side. And the New Testament is full of this kind of language. Thanks be to God, he gives us the victory. God leads us in triumphal procession. Do I think of myself like that? It was a real challenge to me this week to realize, no, I don't. I slink around much too often as if I'm on the losing side, feeling a bit beleaguered by the world, certainly weighed down by, by my sin and the circumstances of life. Oh, we can be super spiritual, as if the victory of Christ means that life is always going to be wonderful, and you and I know that is not the case. The New Testament knows that's not the case. We still sin, we still experience sickness, we still get attacked by people. Ask our brothers and sisters around the world, horrific persecution in some cases. Don't be super spiritual, but I suspect that's not my danger. My danger is to be subspiritual and to be very aware of ongoing sin and circumstances which are difficult and opposition, but to forget that in the midst of that, in all these things, said Paul in Romans 8, we are more than conquerors. In all these things, they still go on. We're familiar with these things. More than conquerors. So sin comes, we're conscious of it, and Satan still accuses, we're victory people. I love Martin Luther, who experienced a lot of the attacks of the evil one accusing him. He said, especially when he went to bed at night, and isn't it often in the middle of the night that negative thoughts come and Satan tries to get in there? And Luther said, you've got to laugh at Satan because he's no longer in heaven. He's been hurled out. He's a defeated enemy. He's a loser. Do you think of Satan as a loser? So Luther gives this example of what he might say to the devil as he comes to him in the the middle of the night accusing him of sin. Oh, yes, old fellow, I know all about that list of sins. You haven't mentioned them all. Let me add a few more that you seem to have forgotten. Put them down too. Saint Satan, since you're so good. I mean, you're you're pointing your finger at me, but have you never committed a sin yourself? Or if I were you, I'd sort yourself out. Physician, heal yourself before you accuse me. Loser. That's what he's saying. Contempt, said Luther, is the best method of winning over the devil. Laugh your adversary to scorn. Well, the circumstances of life, you're feeling weighed down at the moment, your body's giving way, you're feeling low. Don't deny them. Those things are tough. Let's not be super spiritual. But don't forget in the midst of them, those things do not define you. You belong to the Lord Jesus. You're on the winning side. You're heading for eternity with him. Even death, which you might say is is the devil's great, great tool, has lost its power because Jesus died and came out the other side. Just this week, a much-loved mother of a friend of mine died. And, of course, there's huge grief And yet he said to me, and we know where she is. And that's victory. That's horrific. But Jesus has won the victory. That's not the end. 
judgment on the world, victory over Satan, and then finally, salvation for anyone. Verse 32, and I, when I'm lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. It's actually a verse that's on the wall behind me. Then if you ever looked at those verses, but there in the middle are some key gospel verses, and I think it's third on the list. There it is. I, when I'm lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. There's a double meaning there, of course. Lifted up as he's lifted onto the cross, but also as he's exalted and glorified. He'll draw all people, not all people without exception. It's possible to reject him. And yet, wonderfully, all people without distinction, all types. It's as if as he opens out his arms. Those arms are there in welcome, ready to draw in all who'll come to him. Anyone, all nations, all backgrounds, all types. Maybe you're thinking, oh, not me. I'm not the religious type. Not me. You don't know what I've done in my life. Not me. I'm from another religion. No, really, you too. The world is deeply divided into all different groups. Jesus welcomes all. And in Christ, all are drawn together. We've been thinking about some of these themes in the last few weeks. And it's been fascinating hearing some of the reaction to that series, not least race and discrimination, those kind of series. And some have said, just couldn't listen anymore. I felt so battered, as if being told off is just too much. Others say, we don't really feel you, you, you began so soft and gentle with us. Well, the reality is we need both encouragement and challenge. I've seen wonderful examples of loving welcome, as well as the challenge. But just in case you're feeling a bit battered, I want you to receive this encouragement, an email I received this week from a Japanese lady. I just remember her. She said, by God's grace, almost 20 years ago, I studied in Oxford as an international student and received Jesus Christ as my saviour and got baptised at St. Ebbs. Led by the Holy Spirit, my husband and I, with our two children, attended St. Ebbs' online service on February the 21st on the topic of discrimination. Your sermon reminded me of how Christian staff and students serving at St. Ebbs were kind, gentle, hospitable, and merciful to me, a Japanese Buddhist student at the time. Because of their Christ-like attitude, I could continue to attend the church and understand the gospel. May the Lord continually bless your church to be the light of the gospel to the international students of Oxford. Your church didn't have discrimination towards me and allowed me to experience the mercy of God the love of Jesus Christ, and the presence of the Holy Spirit. That's part of why, even though I met persecution in Tokyo, I was able to keep my faith in Jesus Christ, my Lord. May God continually protect and guide St. Ebb's Church with his glorious grace for the advance of, advancement of his kingdom. Isn't that encouragement? Well, may the Lord continue to strengthen us in that because we've got good news for anyone and everyone. And so while we praise God for stories like that, and people who are coming, and some of you, from surprising backgrounds perhaps, who've come to faith in Jesus, let's keep asking ourselves the question, who's not here? And how can we pray for them? Well, we need to bring this all down to earth. What's the decisive moment of your life? The hour struck me this week that the decisive moment of my life was the decisive moment of Jesus' life, was the decisive moment for the history of the world. That moment where Jesus died on the cross has had more impact on my life than anything that I've done. My whole life revolves 
around it. And getting that changed everything for me many years ago now. And living in the light of it, well, that's the revolution that needs to take place every day, every day, every day. In Jesus' terms, we haven't really got time for 35 and 36. We need to respond. Let me just read it. He says, you're going to have the light just a little while longer. Walk while you have the light before darkness overtakes you. Whoever walks in the dark does not know where they're going. Believe in the light while you have the light. What's the challenge? Well, for some, believe in the light for the first time. Here's the light of Christ revealed in the darkness of the cross. Believe in it. And that's something not just for the moment of conversion. Now, today, do I believe these things? Because this is not just a doctrine to tick in my head. Do I really believe that moment is the turning point of history? If so, I'm going to turn from the sin that wants to keep Jesus out of my life. If that's so, I'm going to rejoice in the victory that he won over Satan. If that's true, I'm going to long that anyone and everyone would share this good news. Believe in the light and walk in the light. Let's pray. Loving Father, how we thank you for the cross. May we never take it for granted. May every day be a day that revolves around what happened on that day. That we live in victory. Believing in the light and walking in the light. For Jesus' sake. Amen.